All right. Welcome, everyone. This is our Science of Mustelids. So uh, thanks for joining us today. We're going to be talking about these really cool creatures. I'm very excited. Um, I always found these animals really fascinating, and so I love to share about them any way that I can. All right. We'll get going here. I'm going to share my screen. All right. All right, so welcome everyone. This is our Science of Mustelids. And if you didn't catch me, uh, my name is Monica McCubrey. I am the Wildlife Education Specialist with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. I've been doing Science of for now almost three years. So um, covered a lot of things, but there's still a lot more things. There's always things to cover. Um, and there's always new information that keeps coming up. That's part of science. So we're always getting new information. All right, so just letting everyone know, I want you to ask questions. I want you to have comments. Uh, just make sure that when you do put them in the chat that they are on topic and relevant to what we're talking about today. Otherwise, we do have that right to remove you and just to be kind to everyone that is on as well. And we won't have a problem. And then also, I just want to point out, I am no expert by any means. I love science. Um, I'm definitely not a biologist by my day job. I have wildlife degrees. Um, I'm a science communicator. And so my job and my expertise is in science communication. Um, but if you ask me questions or comments that I'm not sure of, I will find someone that can answer those for you. So um, I do try to my best to be accurate, but everyone makes mistakes all the time. So that's that's part of science. I'm no expert, but I'm an expert in science communication. All right. So let's go ahead. We got a ton of, to get through today. Um, I always say that just because I pack so much information in this because I just have so much to say and there's so much cool things to say about these animals. So um, what in the world is a mustelid? So um, when we talk about this group of animals, it's not necessarily a single species or a single focus. It is a group of animals. So um, mustelids, a lot of people might call them musky mustelids or stinky mustelids. Um, we know of skunks. Skunks actually used to be in this family, but then genetic um, analysis kind of revealed that they are not quite close to these animals. So they're actually in their own group now. They're called Mephitidae, um, and so they're separated from this animal, but it kind of encompasses that odor or that smell, that musk that we talk about. And so we'll talk about that today. So what is a mustelid? So they're technically called the weasel family. There's more to them than just weasels, but they are in this, it's called over-encompassing the weasel family. I like to call them like the dash hounds of the uh, carnivore mammal world, just simply because most of the creatures in this group have those long, like tubular bodies with short little legs, kind of like a dash hound or a wiener dog. So um, this group includes more than than just weasels, but it does include things like polecats, ferrets, martens, stoats. Um, this is a picture of a wolverine. Um, very cool animals. Um, there's actually been some reports in Nebraska, not recently, but we'll get to that. Um, but also things like badger. So over encompassing, there's about 55 species in this family. It's a very large family. Um, when we talk about it, but they all have certain things in common with each other that we'll get to here in a little bit, but they are carnivores. Um, so some of these animals we'll talk about today, they can eat some plant material, but overall, um, a lot of them are just simply strictly carnivores and they have fur bearing carnivores. So uh, they inhabit lots of different regions. So they're terrestrial. There's some that are semi-aquatic. There's some that are fully aquatic. Um, they're pretty much found throughout the world natively, except for Antarctica, Australia, and most oceanic islands, which makes sense simply because they're a large carnivore. We don't see a lot, a lot of large carnivores on those oceanic islands. Islands, um, but many of them I'm sure we're familiar with uh, simply because they either are found in the areas that we are in or a lot of us have heard that they are commercially um, and raised and trapped a lot of the times because of their pelts. So their pelts are very thick. They're very luscious. They're very um, sought after by a lot of people, especially way back in the days when people would make like weasel coats or mink coats or things like that. And when you thought of like rich people or people that had a lot of money, they had pelts. And so mink was one of the, um, and still kind of is today, there's a lot of uh, commercial mink farms, um, but a lot of those were really highly sought after animals. 
All right. So what's their evolutionary history? So about 32 to about 30 million years ago, there was this group and over encompassing, it was called Mustaloida, Mustaloidia. So this whole big group um, emerged a very long time ago. And then during the Oligocene, basically this group diversified into four more divisions. Um, so those four divisions were carnivore mammals, and they shared characteristics by their skull shape, by their teeth. And then they were actually, which is hilarious to think about, their sister group. So this group that shares the most characteristics with them are pinnipeds. And if you're not familiar with a pinniped, it's a seal. So seals and mustelids are very closely related. I guess it kind of fits when you think about like hippos and whales, they share a lot of characteristics as well. So um, so those four primary divisions, when we think about it, are mephitids, so the skunks. Um, so they're not in the mustelid family, but they're closely related. And then also the Alluridae, which are red pandas. Um, and then also Procyonidae, which are things like the coatis, like in Mexico, South America. And then also our raccoons that we see here quite frequently in Nebraska even. And then the mustelids. So this is your weasels and your badgers and your martins. So um, the mustelids. Stellids themselves rose separately about 16 million years ago. And so originally what was happening is that there was early offshoots. Um, these special ecological niches were being filled by things like badgers and martens. Um, and then later they kind of diverged to fill other ecological niches, which are things like weasels and polecats and minks and otters. So a lot of those we have in Nebraska. All right, so their natural history, there's a 55 species in this group. So there's a really large variety of them. They look very differently from each other. But again, we all know that they have to share some characteristics because they're in the same family. Um, so we have the least weasel. We actually have those in Nebraska. It's going to be your smallest, most ferocious of the group, probably um, for its size. Um, it's the smallest carnivore uh, in the United States and the North America, and it's the least weasel. Weasel. They measure about four to 10 inches long, so a little less than a ruler. Um, and then they also weigh usually about two ounces. So very, very small. Um, and then the sea otter on the other end of that, which we do not have in Nebraska, we have the river otter, not the sea otter. The sea otter is the largest. They're sometimes around a meter long, so almost a little bit more than three feet, and they weigh anywhere between 50 to 100 pounds. So very different different from that least weasel, but still same family. And then also we have the largest terrestrial mustelid, so not a sea otter, which is fully aquatic. We have the wolverine. So we don't have them here in Nebraska. They're more of a northern species. They're found throughout the northern United States and throughout Canada and northern Europe. So a little bit different. They weigh about um, not as much as a sea otter. They only weigh about 50 pounds, but they're very ferocious. Um, we all know like Michigan, the wolverines, um, but they also talk about them measuring about 1.2 meters. So about the same size as a sea otter, but also just a little bit smaller in weight. All right, so when we talk about a mustelid, it's all about the body. I mentioned earlier, I always think of them as like the dash hounds of the carnivore world because look at them, long body, long tail, tiny little stumpy legs. So um, most of them, they have that very long, like tubular shaped body um, and they have short legs. They usually have a pretty like thick neck. Um, if you ever look at a, a mink versus a weasel here in a little bit, I'll show you the differences, but they also have quite a small head. So ferrets are also in this group. Um, it's like the quintessential um, mascot of the mustelids because long body, short little legs, big thick neck, tiny little head. They usually all have that. And then usually um, being in this group, you have to stink. So you have to be musky mustelids. So all species in this group have really well-developed anal scent glands. So we'll talk about how they use that old fashion here for communication in a little bit. Um, but that's one of the things that makes you a mustelid. And then each of their legs, they have five digits on each of their feet. They have very sharp, non-retractable claws, so they cannot bring their claws in. They are out all the time. Males in the species are normally a little larger than females, um, and they also have a very high metabolism. So constantly you're seeing these animals, especially small ones like the least weasel, 
or the stoats or the martins, the minks, they're constantly looking for food and they're constantly foraging because they have such a high metabolism. They're always very active and they're very inquisitive and they're on the constant search for prey. All right, so just really quickly, what does their diet look like? So most of them are strictly carnivorous. Um, some of them do eat a little plant material. When we talk about plant material, it's not like small little shoots or roots or things like that. It's mostly berries. So something that's a little bit more substantial than like a leaf. Um, they also have very strong canine teeth. So right here, sharp molars and premolars. Um, some of them have highly specialized diets. Um, there is a, not in Nebraska, but there is a, what's called the clawless otter. They're very specialized in their food. They only eat crabs. Very rarely they will eat fish if that's the only thing they can find and they're hungry, but they have specialized teeth to crack open those crustacean shells. And then also some specialization in their diets can even occur between the sexes. So males versus females. Some males are so much larger than the females that they have to eat different types of foods. Um, sometimes the weasels will consume larger prey than the females. That's usually the biggest size difference when between species is in the weasels. Males are significantly larger than the females. All right, so just kind of just some odds and ends thrown in here as far as like encompassing what is a mustelid. So most species are normally solitary. They don't have a lot of family groups. Um, the European badger, which we don't have in Nebraska, we have the American badger. The European badger is in like groups. Um, so there are some certain species that do have a little bit more social experience than others, but mostly things like badgers um, in Nebraska, the American badger, martin, stoats, weasels, they're very solitary, except for the times that they need to come together for mating and breeding. And then again, they're on their own, they're solitary. Um, mating normally occurs in the spring for most species. Um, ovulation is induced during copulation. So usually it takes quite a while for that to happen. Um, so oftentimes their breeding times will be very long. Uh, females then will generally raise their young alone. And then only the least weasel produces two litters yearly. Other species, it's annually. So they have a very short window of time. They mate, the female raises everything, and then that is their litter for the year. They're not like bunnies where they can have, um, you know, five, six litters sometimes a year. All right, so where are they? Like I mentioned earlier, they have a very large territory. So they're distributed all the way from the Arctic to the tropics. They occupy nearly every terrestrial or land habitat. And there are seven, or sorry, there are several species of semi. So live in the water part of the time, part of the time on land, or nearly fully aquatic like the sea otter. They inhabit those freshwater, wet rivers, and also streams, but they can also do those coastal marine waters like the sea otter as well. Um, even some species um, have been introduced into New Zealand. So they're not native to that area. And that's kind of an oceanic island, but they have been introduced in there. Um, not sure why. All right. So physical description. Um, most species, again, slender bodies, but there are a little stockier animals like the wolverines and the badgers. They have a little bit more broader body. So they're still in the same family, but they're on that stockier end rather than like a weasel or a ferret. Um, their skull is elongated and they have relatively short rostrum. So when you look at the rostrum or the nose really is what you're looking at, um, it's really short. So if you would look at something like a badger skull versus like a dog or a coyote. Dogs and coyotes have a really long nose because they have all that smelling capability. Uh, these guys, it doesn't mean that they have bad sense of smell by any means, but they just their habitat and their niche usually needs them to have a little bit shorter of a rostrum. Um, their ears are also pretty short, um, their legs are short, and then each leg has five digits, again, with those non-retractable claws. Um, males, as far as the weasels go, they're usually about 25% larger than the females. Um, many of them also have very thick, oily coats. Um, a lot of the pictures, if you're looking at them and noticing, they look like they have, um, that they're wet or that they're oily. Um, they're supposed to be like that. So a lot of them, again, and that's one of the reasons why they're so sought after, especially things like mink or weasels. Um, it's the coloration and it's the very thick, dense, oily fur. It's waterproof. Uh, most of them are waterproof. And so it's a really great like thing that people wanted so much. 
All right, so I have a cute little video. Um, this is a least weasel, so the smallest of the weasels. Um, you Maybe you're asking why it's white. A lot of them, especially in the northern range, they get a lot of snow, more snow than us. Um, they turn white in the winter to blend in with their habitat. Um, sometimes in Nebraska, we've seen this as well, but most of them in the southern range, they usually stay brown because that fits more with their environment. So here's just a quick video of how they move. It's adorable. Look at that long body, long tail. So cool. Whee! Okay. <laughs> All right, so their teeth and their skulls, um, what do they look like? So their canines, you can see right there, those very long top two teeth um, are very long. And then the carnassials um, are very well developed. This is because they are constantly grabbing food. They're tearing, they're biting, they're carnivores. They need strong teeth to um, cut into that flesh and to rip off the flesh. Um, upper molars are often narrow in the middle, giving them almost like an hourglass shape. So if you ever find a skull and you're not sure what it is, one of the first things I usually look at is the size of the skull to kind of tell myself, okay, is this going to be badger size? Is this going to be bunny size or muskrat beaver size? What am I looking at? But then also the teeth are like the number one thing that I usually look at. Um, I can tell right away whether it is a carnivore, an herbivore, or an omnivore. You can tell by the shape of the teeth, the well-developed, while you talked about canines or carnassials. Um, it's just a quick, easy way to tell kind of what you're looking at and helps you process of eliminate what other species it could not be. And then also most species have a very powerful bite. Uh, this is a wolverine picture. It's a great picture that I could find that actually has the mouth open. Um, and you can see they're not huge animals. They're only about 50 pounds, but their bite is so strong because of what they're eating. Also, if you ever look at like a badger, um, badger in Nebraska, like the American badger, if you look at their skull, they have normally a very distinct triangular shaped skull. Um, that is, and their face is also triangular as well. Um, so when they're tunneling or they're fossorial animals, they're going underground, they're trying to get into those burrows and those crevices. Um, it helps their head fit in there better and then they can start digging. So um, some species, however, if you look at a river otter, they're pretty flat. This helps them be streamlined so that they can swim through the water. Um, basically, it looks like someone sat on their skull because it's so flat and long, um, but then very different compared to like a badger, for instance. All right, so their reproduction, most species are polygamous. Um, some are promiscuous, so they don't they don't mate for life or anything like that. It's basically like just getting your genes out there and um, finding a mate. Um, social organizations also vary within species. There's not a ton of species that are pretty social. Uh, river otters are one that are um, oftentimes they're in family groups and then also it's pretty cute to see like the uh, the cute little European badgers that we don't have in Nebraska and they look like they're gonna invite you to tea in their cozy country cottage and then we have the American badger who looks ferocious and powerful like it's gonna jump you in a back alleyway because they're very different but they are the same species of badger so ours here in Nebraska they live by themselves they're solitary until it's breeding season the ones in Europe um the cute little ones, they are the ones that are in groups or family groups. Um, they also require prolonged periods of copulation, like I mentioned earlier, because that is what actually induces the ovulation of those unfertilized eggs. Uh, one thing that a lot of mustelids also have is delayed implantation. So it takes a while, sometimes up to 10 months. Um, they can decide when that fertilized egg gets implanted in the uterus, and then they have a better chance of them being born at a time when there's better resources and there's food availability. Most of them breed seasonally. Sometimes the length of reproduction varies among species, but also the length of daylight, the environment, lots of other small little things. Um, the onset of breeding usually lasts about three to four months. Again, it just depends if it's a nor more northern species, if it's a more southern species. Um, it's very different and it depends on where you are and the species that we're talking about.
All right, so that delayed implantation that I talked about. So sometimes that fertilized uh, embryo takes up to 10 months to implant into the uterus in some species. Many mustelids will do this. It's just a, a niche thing that they found. A lot of species can do this. Bats can do this too, um, but it's a way for them to hold on. They're breeding. They're able to mate and be with, a, be with someone, and then they have to wait afterwards to make sure that when they're young or born, that they're going to have resources, that it's going to be the right time of year, they're going to have a lot of food to eat. It's like waiting for them. It's ad advantageous for them to make sure that their species survives. Um, females usually give birth to a single litter. Um, size kind of varies. The average I found was 2.2, which is such a weird number, but uh, I found anywhere from one to seven babies at a time. Um, again, the least weasel is the only one that has two litters a year. Everyone else usually just has one. Um, but like I mentioned, those living in a more seasonal climates, they are the ones that often are going to delay that implantation um, longer simply because it gets colder. There's sparse resources. It makes sense. In southern climate areas, they might not need to do that as long, but they can still do it during the harshest part of the winter. All right, the younger altricial, uh, simply meaning that they need a lot of help when they're born. Um, just like people, the babies, we cannot have a baby and then it's on its own. It just won't survive. Um, there are some species like um, impalas or deer, oftentimes they're born very, very quickly. They're able to take care of themselves. I think it's around two months for mustelids, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it is for different species. Um, and then also females will defend territories in order to acquire enough resources and care. And then oftentimes the female will protect them and nurse them in a den or a burrow, either one that she has dug or one that she's taken over that was an abandoned beaver or muskrat den or something like that. All right, so that was like very um, vague overview of what mustelids are. Um, so now I want to kind of go into their behavior a little bit. Um, like I mentioned earlier, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat. I think I'm going to wait till the very end and we can answer all those questions. So if you want to wait till the end or if you feel like you're going to forget, go ahead and put it in the chat and I will get there. All right, so here's the cute little European badgers that everyone talks about. Um, these are the ones that are in those family groups, um, but these guys are either nocturnal or diurnal when we talk about mustelids. We don't really have crepuscular species, but given the environmental conditions, they could always change um, just to be more advantageous about resources and the heat and things like that. Um, but many of these like narrow-bodied animals, like the weasel that we saw earlier, they're very quick and they're agile. They bound, they scamper like we showed. The stockier ones like the wolverine, the badgers, they're a little bit more, um, I don't know, they like waddle is a good way. Um, they're just not as agile and quick as those tiny little species. Um, but there are a lot of good species that are great swimmers, great jumpers, they're good climbers. It all just depends on where they are and what resources they're looking for. A lot of those little species, though, they spend a ton of time on the ground. They're searching in, for food in crevices, burrows. Um, many species will shelter in burrows as well. Um, and then, it again, it just depends on what they're looking for as far as their food goes. All right, communication. So they have pretty good hearing. They have pretty good vision. But olfaction is really well developed. So this is how these species communicate with each other. Um, it could be lots of different scent cues. Um, they might be looking for food. Um, they might be defending territory. It might be talking to each other in, in terms of reproduction and where they are as far as reproduction. But it, scent marking is like the main form of communication in this family. Um, so when we talk about that secretions from like well-developed scent gland function, um, basically for territory, they're indicating their reproductive state. It's also a way to social, um, and for those species that are social with each other, um, but the degree and function of the scent varies among species. And it also, uh, is according to like their environmental conditions and also within species themselves. All right, so here uh, we talked about animals being social versus solitary. These are some cute little river otters that we have. Um, and then this is just a little clip video about how social these animals are. Very different than like weasels or badgers.
So they're kind of just rubbing. You can kind of see they're making, um, they have some scent glands um, up by their neck as well. So it's not all anal secretions. There's lots of different ways, um, but <laughs> you can see the, that one just pooped. Um, so they're making scent communications and this one's like, nope, I'm going to poop on top of yours because I'm more territorial than you are. So it's just a way for them uh, to show you how important that scent and that olfaction communication can be. All right, so what's it smell like or what exactly is this odor that we talked about? Um, it's comprised of a lot of chemicals, um, but a lot of it is provided by undigested food materials, um, chemicals synthesized by um, bacteria. So like scent organs, they provide a lot of areas that are really moist and warm, like that anaerobic environment, and which is really favorable for bacterial development. So it makes the interesting smell. Um, but there are a lot of different odor sources by these mustelids. It's not just those anal secretions, but it could be urine, feces, skin glands, um, even those scent producing organs as well in the body. And then that transmission of information between individuals is basically essential to keeping that complex social life of those animals. So if they're a very social group like the river otters or the European badgers, they need that to keep their, um, basically to keep their group working. So it, that's how they communicate and talk talk to each other. Um, why exactly do they have this scent marking function? There's a lot of hypothesis when we talk about this, um, but basically we believe that it conveys information um, about the resident and the territory that are in it. We believe that's why it evolved, um, but territoriality in mammals um, often appears when limited resources are very limited. And so that energetic terms, it's more important for individuals to minimize that energy that they're expending. And so in defense, they're doing this to mark those territories and maintaining basically that effective defense. So they don't want to waste energy by um, telling other animals and telling people, this is my territory. I'm trying to fight you all the time. That's very energy expensive. So what they're doing is they're marking it. And then you come across, oh, this is your territory. My mistake. I'm going to go this way. Um, um, there are still some species that will enter anyway, and there's species that overlap in territory, but it's a great way for them to basically keep their energy inside and they don't have to expend it. All right, so function of that scent marking, it's a defense of a territory. It dramatically reduces the chance of direct contact or conflict between rivals. So each rival, even if you think you're the larger, better, stronger, mustelid, um, you're still expending energy, whether you're fighting or you're kind of on the defense. Um, so this scent marking basically is a way to reduce that contact so that all animals can do better and they can preserve that energy. Uh, so individual recognition through scent marks has been shown to exist. So you can recognize individuals based on their scent, um, especially in some species of carnivore. Um, and this could really help with that avoidance strategy. So I know who you are. It's your scent is telling me that you're pretty big. You're pretty strong. You're in heat right now. I'm not going to, not going to bother you. Um, but that's a way for them just to kind of communicate. And then they don't have to like fight each other, or have that direct contact with each other. All right, so it's often uh, observed in special places inside the mustelid territory. They usually don't just mark wherever. There's special places and there's special reasons that they do that. Um, it's on like very conspicuous objects. So if there's a very big um, down tree or a stump or a log or something like that, that a lot of animals will move across, they're going to smell it. Um, it's a point where paths dissect at a specific linear feature, or it's a conjunction of paths. So basically it's somewhere where animals are going to travel a lot, they're going to smell this, and they're going to know what's going on. Um, the specific positioning of scent marks or implies that they could also function as an intra-group communication. So even within the same species and the same family, they're saying that they can communicate with each other. And also, um, animals have learned over time that when they do smell it, it's the experience or the previous experience that they've had, and also the developmental status of that receiving animal. So the whole idea of communication is you're sending a signal, and there's someone to receive that information. So um, it's a great way for these animals basically to um, know who's there and also know what's happening. The odor of those, um, basically any mammalian 
scent mark is normally like this really complicated cocktail mixture of chemicals. Um, and basically that factors and governs the response that those animals will produce. So the certain smell and the certain chemicals that make it up are going to basically elicit a certain response. And that's what that animal wants. That receiving animal um, is going to get it. All right. So this stuff that they use when we call musk or musky mustelids or musty mustelids. Um, if you know anything about skunks, um, the cartoons always show like a skunk. Um, it almost looks like a fart or it's like a group of like air or gas. It's definitely not. If you've ever been sprayed or had a dog been sprayed, you know that it's like this really thick, oily, yellowish fluid. It's the same in like these guys. They're pretty much very closely related. And it's a very powerful and often unpleasant smell, at least to a lot of humans. I do know some people that don't mind the smell of skunk, um, but it's pretty strong. Um, and these animals might like it and they might not like it as well. So um, so that musk is basically produced by a modified skin gland. They're grouped at one end of the anal sac and basically everything empties into it. Uh, so these animals they can release small amounts. Um, they have the opportunity to voluntarily release whenever they want to. Um, and what happens is that um, the muscles will control both of the openings on the glands and the walls of it. Um, so animals can expel that musk. And again, it's voluntarily. The only thing is sometimes they get really frightened and basically they just empty it all. They're just very scared. Um, a lot of trappers will call this a stink bomb um, and you know that it's there. So we know that that animal is particularly frightened in that area and it just basically involuntarily just released everything because it was so scared. Um, but along with the musk, carnivores especially will use like scat and urine to also communicate with each other. All right, so that was probably more than you ever wanted to know about musk and glands and, and smells, um, but it's very important for this group of animals, and that's what makes mustelids. So they have that special um, odor-producing um, sac that they will use to communicate with each other. So that was pretty much what I had as far as their background, their life history, their morphology, that kind of stuff. I do want to go ahead and talk about animals in Nebraska and what they look like and what species we have here in our state. All right, so the diversity, we don't have 55 species. We have five species. You could maybe say we have six, um, but technically we have five. If you looked it up in our book, which ones are present here now? Um, we have the American badger, the North American river otter, the least weasel, the long tailed weasel, the American mink, and then technically black-footed ferrets are on our list. We don't have any in Nebraska that we know of. There's no known populations, but we've historically had them and we do have the correct habitat. If we ever did get black-footed ferrets, they most likely could live in places in Nebraska. Um, Wolverine, we've had a few records way back when, um, but with climate change and everything shifting around and animals don't know borders, we could certainly see more. Um, we're not sure. So we've just recently gotten sightings of moose in Nebraska. So anything's possible. Um, but the historical records for uh, wolverines was in 1887 and 1837. They were both in the panhandle of Nebraska. We believe that they are ones that are just walking through, um, but people either observed a species or they had um, tracks or something like that. There's good evidence that they were here. All right, so the American badger, you remember seeing the cute little European, please come to my cozy country cottage. This is the American badger. So primarily, this is a Great Plains animal. Um, they're found within the region of North America. They really like these open grasslands and fields and pastures. Um, and if you've ever seen a badger, they kind of have that lumbering type gait or the way that they walk. Um, but they have a flattened body, short legs, and they're pretty stocky. Um, but the fur is pretty distinguishable. Some people have had a little issue, is this a skunk at night or is this a badger? Um, but the fur on the back and kind of the flanks of the animal, they're usually kind of a grayish to a reddish color, depending on where you're finding them. Most likely in Nebraska, they're like that grayish color, but the face is pretty distinct. So they have this black and white stripes on them and they have that white dorsal stripe that runs all the way down um, right between their eyes. And then their chin is also whitish with black patches. Um, and again, a pretty distinguishable face that they have. Um, 
scientists have been finding that these guys have really expanded their range, especially since the 20th century. They're now found as far east as Ontario, Canada. So um, they're definitely expanding their range. Um, and again, it really depends on what they look like, depends on where you're finding them. So these guys have a pretty wide range in the in North America. So ones in Nebraska might look very different than ones that you would find in Utah or Canada. They're the same species, but some Sometimes their coats and their colors just look a little bit different. All right, so mating occurs in the late summer and usually early fall. Um, these guys do have the ability to delay that implementation of that embryo. It's usually delayed until December or as late as February, just depending on the environment and what's happening as far as the climate goes. Uh, these guys are excellent diggers. If you look in the um, picture here, they have these very long, they're not sharp claws. They're not like the movie Wolverine is what I was thinking, but they, they're not that sharp, um, but they're just these huge, thick nails. They're excellent dingers. They have these super powerful forearms. Um, they have a nictitating membrane. So they have like a third eyelid that they can shut when they're digging so they don't get dirt in their eyes. Um, they're carnivorous. So they eat things like ground squirrels, moles, prairie dogs, wood rats, um, sometimes ground nesting birds, but these guys are um, 90 percent of their diet is ground squirrels, moles, and prairie dogs, other things that are also going to be underground. Uh, one of the things I found that was super interesting about the badgers is that they are so strong, they can dig through blacktop and two inches of concrete to dig their burrow. So sometimes people that do road maintenance hate badgers or kind of find them a nuisance because they are such good diggers. Um, they will dig that and what happens is a large truck or someone will run over um, the blacktop and then the blacktop and the concrete will collapse because um, there's nothing underneath. The badger has dug it all out and so something heavy goes on top and it crushes in the road. So People a lot of times find them sometimes a nuisance, um, but they are pretty cool animals. Uh, they have been known to also cache their food. So they will find something that's either dead or they'll eat part of their meal and then store it later. There's a really cool YouTube video. If you look, I believe it was in Utah. They put a camera trap out. There was a cow that um, had died and this badger found it. And over, uh, I think it was about two days, this badger basically just dug around the cow and covered the entire cow with dirt and cached their food or stored their food so that it could eat it later. It was a free meal for them, um, but it's kind of a cool video. It's like a time lapse. Uh, so if you go get a chance to YouTube that, it's pretty neat. All right, so we have the North American river otter. Um, up until 2020, it was considered a threatened species in Nebraska. We had very few river otters. Um, they were here historically, and then people trapped them for their pelts. And so at one point they were extirpated or gone from Nebraska. Game and Parks was one of the agencies that kind of implemented them getting back. So we borrowed river otters from other states to rebuild our population, and now they're doing fairly well. So it's kind of one of those success stories. Um, but they have these really streamlined bodies. They have fully webbed feet. If you can look in that picture here, you will see the webbing between their feet. Um, they have a very long tapered tail. Um, they're pretty thick at the base and they're flat. Um, this is to help them steer in the water. Um, they have very dense oily fur that helps them insulate in the water and keep Keeps them warm in the winter time. Um, in the winter time, if you ever get to touch one of their pelts, um, scientists like counted, but they have such thick, dense fur that in a certain square inch of their fur, there's about a million hairs like compacted in that square inch. So that is what makes them so sought after and so waterproof. So kind of interesting, but they have a keen sense of smell and they have a lot of prominent facial whiskers, what they will use to feel for things underwater. Um, but their burrows are normally um, former muskrat, beaver, or woodchuck homes. Uh, there was a really cool paper and presentation given by someone at the Legacy Conference here last week about how muskrats are so important for lots of different animals that people are starting to consider them a keystone species because animals will use their abandoned burrows um, and they'll eat them a lot. Um, they're just very important to the environment.
Um, so river otters, crayfish make up a ton of their diet, but they'll pretty much eat fish, they'll eat snakes, they'll eat frogs, small ducks, turtles, anything that's by the water. Um, they're pretty nocturnal, although sometimes in the winter you will see them out during the day. They do not hibernate, so they're active all year long. Um, and these guys, they communicate through that scent marking. So we saw just a little bit ago about how those um, river otters were pooping and then that one came over and was like, no, I can do this before you. And so it pooped on top of it. Those are called latrine sites. So they're regularly visited sites, maybe not that one in the video, but these are specific sites where they will poop and deposit their droppings and then the secretions from their musk and then other animals in that group will do it there too. So it's like the bathroom site, but it's also like the hub for communication. It's like the water cooler in an office. It's like where you get all the information, but you're like getting water, that kind of thing. But again, like I mentioned, they were removed from the threatened list in about 2020. And now if you're lucky, you can see them in just about every tributary in the state. All right, the least weasel, um, this is like the video that we saw, the white one, um, long body, short tail. They have a very flattened head. Um, in the summer, they are usually a brown color. And then in the winter time, it just kind of depends on where they're found, what range. Um, but sometimes they're whitish with those brown flecks. Sometimes they're completely white. Sometimes they will change their color depending on the season. But again, it just kind of depends on that range and where you're finding them. Um, these guys eat a lot of small rodents. So they're found in meadows, grasslands, marshy, shrubby habitat, um, but they eat a ton of small rodents. Um, they're the smallest of all the weasels. Um, and also their fur will fluoresce under UV light. So if you ever have a weasel in your hand and you have a UV light at the same time, you go like this, their fur will actually glow or fluoresce under that UV light. I'm not sure why, but it's very interesting. Um, some bats will do that too, um, but they're found in a variety of habitats. All right, so here's one that's in the summertime, what they look like, um, but they're specialized small mammal predators. They eat a lot of mice. They have a very uh, high metabolism, so they have to constantly eat. 40 to 60% of their body weight every single day, they're eating that much. Um, these guys also have a huge mortality rate. The average lifespan is only one year, so very quick. 75 to 90% of weasel die before they ever reach their first year of life. So um, it's a hard life being a least weasel, um, but they also were blamed historically for game bird deaths. So a lot of people thought that they would eat the eggs of turkeys and pheasants and things like that. Um, they had been a focus of past predator control. So a lot of times people would poison them. They would actively seek them out and trap them because they believe they were responsible for eating all the turkeys and the pheasant eggs. Um, now we know that that's not true. It's not a total impossibility that they could eat an egg here and there, but we know that they are primi primarily mice and voles. That's what they're eating. These guys are often the most confused with a mink as well. Um, I'll show you the mink here in a second. I believe it's the next one up. Um, I think the long tail weasel is next, but I think the weasels look like they have their life together. And then all the pictures of the minks that I'll show you, they look like they're, um, they're just very stressed. All right, so here's the long tail weasel. These guys are adorable, but they have the very long tail with the black tip on it. They have really um, big whiskers, long, kind of a short neck, big ears, short legs. Um, they have brown fur on the top and then on the belly, it's kind of a whitish to a yellowish color. Um, in the northern parts of the range, they also will turn white in the winter time, but in the southern parts, they kind of stay the same color that they are. Um, they're carnivore, so they eat lots of small rodents and um, very similar to the least weasel. They're found throughout most of the United States, except in portions of southeastern California and Nevada, just not the right habitat for them. Um, but they will have babies, usually four to eight. They make a nest out of grass. Um, and they will line their nest with fur. They're nocturnal. As you can see, they're good tree climbers and they're also good swimmers. Um, these guys will eat mice, voles, gophers, rabbits, anything that they can catch. Um, they have a very powerful bite force for their size. And so they will occasionally take birds as well, but they basically crush the skull of their prey with their canine. So big crushing and biting force. 
They have also have a very high metabolism. So again, constantly searching, constantly foraging to eat about 40% of its body weight every single day. Um, but they do use scent and sound to track their prey. Uh, these guys also have a lot of vocalizations, which a lot of people don't realize when you talk about mustelids, but they do. They have squeals, squeaks, trills, um, and purrs as well. Um, but they also like a wide variety of habitats. So pretty much anywhere, um, woodlands, thickets, open areas, grasslands, farmlands. But one thing that we always found is by their habitat, they're always usually near a water source, which kind of makes sense just depending on how small they are and that kind of thing. All right. So think about it. The weasel looks like it's all slick and has its life together. And then like minks are just like, I don't know, they're just like, their fur is just kind of poofy and they're just like they stressed. Um, but this is a mink, very similar looking to our long tail weasel and our least weasel. They're kind of hard to tell apart from each other if you're not sure what you're looking at. But same thing, long body. They have a sleek body. They're about two feet long. So that's pretty large um, for an animal. You don't think they're that big, but they have short stubby legs. They have small ears, small eyes, a very thick tail. Their fur is soft and it's covered with oily guard hairs. So if you touch a pelt, the very top um, hairs that you're feeling are those guard hairs. And then underneath, they're a little bit more dense and it's a little bit more soft. It's like downy feathers. They're called downy fur. Um, so it's slightly webbed feet because minks are semi-aquatic. So they don't spend all their time in the water, but they also can come on land. Um, they live in forested areas near rivers and streams. Uh, usually one third of their body length is their tail. So when we talk about a mink, that's a great way to identify. Look at the tail. All right, these guys eat pretty much anything. Muskrats, rabbits, mice, snakes, frogs, birds. They pretty much eat anything they can find in their habitat. Um, these guys will also dig dens in river banks. They also will use abandoned um, beaver or muskrat dens, but they never use the same den for very long. It's too much of a risk. They're constantly on the move. Um, they will have their mating season between January and April. They spend a majority of their time in the water hunting for food. I think most people, when they see a mink, they think they're seeing a beaver or a river otter or something else. Um, you're, you're going to know if you see a beaver, river otter, they're pretty large. Um, if you're seeing something a little bit smaller, it could be a muskrat, also a mink. So think about that if you ever see something. Mink are also very territorial. They will fight other minks that invade their territory. So they're very um, territorial when it comes to their space. All right. And then the last one I wanted to talk about Again, we don't have a population in Nebraska. There are no known populations, not saying that it, it's not a possibility. We just don't know of any right now. Um, but historically, Nebraska had them. They, like many of our animals, they were extirpated. Um, and at the time, we thought that the only population was in Wyoming. So very long time, we thought that they were um, extinct. And then one day, a lady's dog actually brought her a dead one on her porch. She opened the screen door, it came up and was like, hi. Hi, good morning. Here's a dead black footed ferret. And the lady was like, Oh my gosh, what is this? So then it launched this like nationwide search about black footed ferrets. So this was in the 80s. Um, and now what happens is it's a hugely studied species. Um, the only native populations in Wyoming, but there are also populations in northeastern Montana and then western South Dakota and southeastern Wyoming. Um, all three of those populations now have been introduced species or introduced animals from zoos and breeding facilities. So um, it, the power of, you know, breeding facilities and zoos, it really does help. Um, these guys, one of the problems is that their diet is made up of almost entirely prairie dogs. And at one point when Great Plains had nothing but bison and prairie dogs, they were doing great. And then all of a sudden people don't like prairie dogs and they're poisoning them and they're getting rid of them. That hurts the black-footed ferret population as well. So um in Nebraska, they're a part of our historical range. They are part of our historical animals. They were here originally. We have the habitat suitable for them. So they are technically labeled as an endangered species, both federally and state listed, um, just because if we ever do have them, we have the good spot to have them. So it's kind of an interesting situation. A lot of people always ask us, why are they here? Or why are they endangered if we don't have any? That's why. 
All right. So that was, that was it. I think I talked more about muscle than I did rattlesnakes. That's kind of interesting. So, um, next week, please join us Thursday at three to 4 PM central standard time. We're going to be talking about animal eyes. So the many different ways that animals see how they look to other species, what colors, what UV, what things are they seeing compared to each other? And then just like the football games, we have a bye week coming up um, October 26th. We actually do not have any science of, but we just extended it. So November 2nd, then we'll talk about canids. We'll work on opossums. And then our very last one will be November 16th, um, venom and poison. So I will send a link to everyone that registered today with all this information and how to register for the next ones. Um, and then also the link to this YouTube video as well. And I think that was it. We have the YouTube, all of our science subs are on there. We have a very active social media account. So Facebook and Instagram, and then also check out our Nebraska wildlife education website as well. All right. We'll see you next week. We're going to be talking about animal eyes Thursday at 3 PM central standard time. Um, I'm going to check the chat here. Cause I think we had some things. Um, Uh, do individuals decide on timing of implantation or is it their DNA that tells them based on resources? Ooh, good question. Um, from what I know is that it is partly both. It just depends on the individual animal, but also the, the climate and the environment that they are in. So if it's a specifically harsh winter or a mild winter, um, they're going to have less time um, to, de to delay simply because they believe the resources are going to be better at the time. Um, and then what was the other part of the question? Timing implantation is their DNA that tells them. So I would say that it's partly both. It's mostly the climate because their bodies are going to know right now there's not a lot of food. It is not a good time to have babies just because they're not going to survive. Uh, someone said, do they have, is that a ferret? Do muscles of different species communicate? Yes. I think we kind of talked a little bit about that. Um, they have those old fashioned, they use the latrine sites like the river otters. They have different urine, feces, scat, um, the musk, um, anal scent glands, um, the glands that they have like in their necks, very th different things. Um, someone said they have polecats, um, very rare and lives in grassy plains. Yes. A lot of people believe that Nebraska has polecats. And I've heard a lot of people say like they use interconnected that a skunk and a polecat are the same. They're very different. We don't have polecats in Nebraska, but I think that you are from Serbia. Was it, I think it was you. Um, so that would make sense that you have those there. Very, very cool. I would love to see one. Um, Someone asked, what does it mean to be in heat? So that simply just means that the female is um, uh, ovulating and as she's ready to mate and then hopefully uh, reproduce with someone um, to have babies. And I should not touch the screen. Thank you for a great program. Yes, I love how people talk about these guys are very cute like that cute little uh, weasel that we looked at that video, but they're ferocious. So like that's the smallest carnivore that we have. And when most people think carnivores, they think tigers and lions and these very large predators. But the fact is that a toad could technically be a carnivore. It eats all the other, other animals. So there's a lot of other animals when we talk about that, but mammalian carnivores, those least weasels are very cute. Um, and they're also, um, they're I don't want to say they're aggressive, but they're just, they're ferocious is a better word for that. All right. I think that was it. Um, but thank you everyone for joining me. I know it's like a gloomy day, at least here in Nebraska, um, but it's going to get chillier and it's October is Nebraska reptile month. So I will go ahead and give everyone that registered today, please fill out those evaluations. This is how we improve our programs. And we can also get some ideas as far as next year for 2024 programming, or should we keep this going? That kind of thing. So I'd love to know everyone's thoughts. Thanks for joining us. And hopefully we see everyone next week, October 19th um, at 3 to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. So thank you. We're going to talk about animal eyes next week. So thank you, everyone. We'll see you later.